Good morning. Our first prelude is in your additional music guide on page two. Come, follow me. Number six, five, zero.
Good morning, everyone. Our opening, or excuse me, our readings for today's Mass are on page 895. If you'd like to put a ribbon to mark that page, 895. And our opening hymn is number 255, 255. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We pray for each other. We pray for our world, for our community here. And we also ask our Lord for his mercy for the times that we have sinned. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. Keep your family safe, O Lord, with unfailing care, that relying solely on the hope of heavenly grace, they may be defended always by your protection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, share your bread with the hungry, shelter the oppressed and the homeless, clothe the naked when you see them, and do not turn your back on your own. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your wound shall quickly be healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove from your myths oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech, if you bestow your bread on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then light shall rise for you in the darkness, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom, 
For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. The word of the Lord. Be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its taste, with what can it be seasoned? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. It is set on a lampstand where it gives light to all in the house. Just so your light must shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your heavenly Father. The Gospel of the Lord. time. <clears throat> when I first started praying over the readings for the Mass this weekend, uh, the line that actually caught my attention, I haven't actually talked about it at any of the Masses, but just before this Mass, or as we, as we were reading the readings, it kind of brought it back to my mind that this is actually where I started. And it's the way St. Paul talks about how God works. And so it talks about this demonstration, demonstration of the spirit and power. And he says, so that your faith may, might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God, right? I want to use that and develop a little bit of a sense of just how that happens in our daily life, just in all the little things and, and in the big things. And I want to use it from the perspective of language. Now, if we go back to the gospel for just a second. So Jesus uses two examples, salt and light. And so my thought on salt is obviously he's speaking in, in a way of taste, right? So we use salt. We use salt to preserve food and things like that, but we use it also for seasoning to taste. 
Now, if you don't use enough, most people would notice, right? They're like, whoa, there's no, there's no taste in this you know, food. I hope there's nobody here from England. If you go to England, I won't say it. We use a lot more salt than they do, I think, in the food, right? There's not a lot of taste. So, generally, when somebody says, whoa, this tastes so good, it's because we feel like they've seasoned the food correctly. As opposed to, also, we take a bite and we're just like, whoa, I think they just dumped the whole bottle of salt in the food, you know? So there's too much. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and he was telling me about someone he knows and he says, yeah, he likes his salt. He puts salt on pepperoni pizza. And that, that's, that's a guy who likes his salt. Okay. The idea of salt, though, is that there is not enough, there is too much, and there's, it's just right. And so the idea that as we go out in the world and as we just live our lives the way God would want us to, there are times where we could have not enough flavor spiritually. In other words, we enter into an environment, we go into a room, we're part of a family, we're with our coworkers, and people never see Jesus. It's not because we're horrible people. We've just not allowed the flavor of God to radiate out. And so there's, there's not that, that beautiful savoriness, if you will, to just Christ present in the world. The other side, using this analogy, is what if there's too much salt? What if, you know, not because you can never have too much God, but the way we present it the way we communicate. So we, we try to bring God, but maybe, maybe too much pride, maybe too much of our pride worked its way in. Maybe we're too afraid. or what, what, Actually, that would be too little salt. But maybe sometimes we become overbearing and we push when we shouldn't be pushing or we demand when Christ would not necessarily want us to demand. And so there's just too much for the person in that moment. Okay, so we want, it, we want our daily life to be savoring. We want Christ to just fully be free to be present. In other words, his power just to radiate. Now, speaking of radiating, light. God speaks of light. You are the light of the world. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the gospel, Jesus doesn't say Christians are the salt of the earth. He doesn't say, my disciples are the salt of the earth. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Every one of you, and me, and all of us. And I think it's really interesting. It's almost accusatory, but in a good way. It's like, no one gets out of this one. We're all in it together. As his sons and daughters. Okay. Now, speaking of light. Yes, you can have too little light. We can have too much light, right? But one of the things I think about light, it's the direction of light. So let's say you have a little kid who's like three years old and you hand them a flashlight for the first time and they're turning it on and off and they're just loving it, right? But they don't understand completely the nature of what it's for. And so what do little kids do? They shine it right back in their face, right? They look at the light because they don't understand that actually a flashlight, light is not meant to draw attention to itself. It's meant to draw attention to everything else that it's shining on. And so in our spiritual life, when we're shining light, Christ's light, we really shouldn't be drawing attention to ourselves. In fact, we almost become unnoticeable because everybody's looking at what Christ is doing, what Christ is shining his light on. If you've ever gone camping, speaking of flashlights, the other thing when you use camping is we use lanterns, right? And lanterns are the worst invention in the world. They're really annoying because no matter how high you hold it, you can't hold it up high enough. It's always going to be shining light right back in your face until somebody comes up with the idea and they kind of hoist it up in the tree. And then finally, you can see everything clearly. It's just too much light because it's coming back right in our eyes. So the direction of light is very important. Now I bring that up. I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of little thoughts right now 
I'm just using these analogies for our daily life. Sometimes, uh, especially for us as Catholics, we get kind of beat up right now out in the world, out in the press. And so when we start getting beat up, what do we want to do? We want to justify ourselves. We want to defend ourselves. And so there can always be this temptation to think that by, by bragging or by showing off, that is the light. But that's not. So when we go out there and we talk about, look at all the great things we're doing, look at all of our great works that we have, that's not shining the light. That's shining the light on ourselves. That's showing off. It's bragging. That's not the light. And so to keep the focus just on what we're supposed to be doing, if people in the world can't see it, we entrust that to God. But we keep the light focused on what Christ is doing. And I, I think that's important right now in our world today. So a couple different thoughts on some of these things. Language. So there's a lot of different languages in the world, but I also mean it in different ways. So for example, your kids are in school, right? They learn math. Math is a language. It, it has all its own rules. It has all its own processes of understanding of how to do things. Um, you'll never see the kids running around out in the playground talking about you know, integrals and trigonometry and kids, they don't do that. It's, it's almost like its own language to understand a concept. Science also, right? We teach our kids science all the time. But most of it they're never going to talk about when they're with their friends. But there's concepts that are very important to communicate certain truths. When we come to Mass, we, we speak a language here. Now, actually, we speak several languages. You notice how here we do the Kyrie, Kyrie eleison, that's Greek. And we do it because Jesus spoke that. He spoke Greek when he worshiped with his disciples. The Jewish people used it for hundreds of years as part of their worship as well. And we've always maintained it. it. It's not just a language like Greek, but it's speaking of a relationship. Facial expressions communicate a lot. But I use this also to talk about how we can miscommunicate. Just like we can show too much light or have too much salt or not enough, sometimes we miss the mark. So for example, when I was 16, my very first job was working at McDonald's. I was a cook in the back. I guess you can call them cooks. I was a cook in the back. And I was very happy back there. I was much happier back there than out dealing with people. I don't like dealing with people. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. You're like, why did you become a priest? I was very happy in the back with me and my hamburgers. So, but there was one particular time my manager came. She walked by, and she was just furious at me. And she said, why don't you smile more? I was having a good day up until that moment. <laughs> and I almost said, probably would have gotten me fired, I almost said, well, I'm a cook at McDonald's. <laughs> that wouldn't have been nice. So it was in that moment I began to realize what I'm feeling is not always what I'm communicating. So sometimes we can miscommunicate. We can even miscommunicate Jesus, right? And I'm not just talking about like facial expressions or body language, but to be mindful that what we're, what we're trying to communicate is for the sake of someone else. And so our faith in communicating it is also needs to be applicable and connect with someone else, right? In the church, we often talk about ministries. We have a lot of ministries. Let's say we have a ministry to the poor, right? And that's great. We do that. We form ministries so that us as, to do things that us as individuals maybe can't necessarily do on our own. So we put a group together to do it. But I also want to talk about just the side of our faith where we're not doing a ministry we're just being Christ 
to others. In other words, we're speaking Christ's language in our daily life. And it's all the little things that become so valuable, that become so powerful, where Christ can just radiate in the middle of Safeway, right? <clears throat> so I shop at Safeway, and uh, just because it's convenient. But sometimes, before they had the self-checkout lines, which I love as an introvert, right? Before they had that, I would get in line. And you know what I would always do, though? I'd try to make it look like nobody noticed, but I would look for the fastest line. And then I would get into that line, which was always the slowest line. <laughs> and I think it's because the Holy Spirit knew what I was trying to do. But I wasn't done yet. I would then look over and see how fast all the other lines are moving. And if one of them was moving a lot faster, I would act like I'm moving over like to read a magazine or something, and I would slowly work my way into a different line. So there's, some, there's something slightly toxic in that, because I think I was giving in to something in our culture, which is we become obsessed with convenience. When we become obsessed with just convenience, we are just thinking of what we want or need. And then we forget that we're actually all in this together. And I mean life here on earth for life in heaven. We're all in this together. We're not competition with each other in the end. So I think sometimes we can do that spiritually. It's like, I think, well, I really want to get to heaven as we're zipping by people and watching them flounder, watching them struggle. And it's like, well, I just really want to get to heaven. But in Christ's heart and with his language, he wants us just to collect as many people with us and help them on, right? Put, help push them, help carry them, help, help them on their way as well. That's the light. That's the salt. So in the middle of Safeway, even sometimes the littlest things can become Christ's light. Now, put that in your work, in, your, in school, for our kids who are in school. You know, our schools here in Marysville are, are struggling. They really are. And there's a lot of great people who are trying their hardest, but they are really struggling. The environment for the kids, figuring things out. Some of the policies are just not the greatest policies. Our kids are struggling. But for one person, just to be the light of Christ is very powerful. Another thought on this. Yes, there are times to correct people. But a lot of times, we can allow our pride to seep in or our anger spews out. And we try to correct them, but it doesn't really correct them. It just makes them feel like they just got beat up, right? To shine the light means we keep pointing the light at Christ. We keep pointing the light at what he's shining on. And so when somebody's looking the other way, when somebody has darkness in their life, they keep turning to a sin or they have some vices in their life, just keep shining that light on what Christ is doing. In other words, keep showing them the alternative the alternative to maybe bad decisions they're making, just keep the light on that. Yes, there are times to correct, absolutely. But most people will come to Jesus because they see him when they finally turn around and look because you're the light of Christ. You're shining that light for them. Okay, a couple thoughts also just on our culture here in America that we have. Just things for us to keep in mind so that we can continue to always be the light of Christ. I feel like in our culture, we're becoming more and more uh, um, uh, desensitized to stealing. Stealing, lying, and cheating. I think they're all kind of part of the same problem. In our confirmation class a number of weeks ago, I, I had brought this up. And I was really naive. I thought when I brought this up, it would just be absolutely clear to the kids and they would all be like, yeah, it's cheating in school, that's wrong. So I used an example. I said, imagine, imagine somebody came up to you with all the answers on the test, right? And all you had to do was study the answers and you would have it. And so I asked them, would you take the answers? Would you cheat? And 
almost all of them said yes. And they weren't ashamed. I mean, I would start, are you, are you sure? Are you really, am I, am I miscommunicating? And they were like, no, no big deal. I was actually kind of shocked. Because that's not how I was raised, right? So a culture of stealing or lying or cheating or that it's acceptable. And for our young people, this is really hard, right? Most of our young people, they're not going to go out in the middle of the night and steal your lawnmower, right? They're not going to do that. But they will get on the internet. And they will be tempted to steal, lie, or cheat. And I feel like our culture is some ways promoting that. So for us, we, we can't be the light of Christ if we can't be authentic, true to ourselves and to who we are and, and to what is good and right. Somebody after the last mass made a comment and I hadn't even thought of it and he said, well, Father, look at their examples. We hear about it all the time, athletes that are caught cheating, um, corruption, we just hear about it all the time. And maybe it's disproportionate. Maybe it's, we hear about it because that's, we, we hear about it because that's in the news. We don't hear about the, the boss at your company who's really honest and making great sacrifices and loves his employees and is doing a great job. They're not in the press. But I do think it's important because, yeah, to be the light of Christ. The other one I already mentioned about convenience. We're not, in, we're not competition with each other. We're here to help each other. We're in it together. The, the last one on this particular uh, point is, you know, we can really give in to this idea where what we actually desire every day is pleasure. I don't necessarily mean sinful pleasure, but just pleasure. You know, it's like, well, I work so that I can have pleasure. But I don't necessarily like my work. I don't want to go to work. I want to change that. To be the light of Christ means we live for love. And so even if my job may not be the best job, if I have love in my heart, I'm going to have some love and respect for my coworkers, and I'm going to try to enjoy being their companion and friend on this journey. And I'm going to live for my family, for my friends, for the neighbors. You know, the new neighbors who just moved in next door, I already love them because Christ already loves me. And so I want to shine that light. And so we live for love. And then because of that, we love to work. We love to work in doing Christ's work, whatever it may be. I think it's, a, it's just a, it's a good way to look at things. Okay. Um, all right. My homily's halfway done. <laughs> just kidding. A couple more points. So I've been, I've been framing all of this in language. One of the most important things about communication is the ability to listen. Now, it can be tempting in our prayers. We can sit down and we can talk the whole time. And then when we're done talking, we say, okay, Lord, I'll see you tomorrow. The ability to listen, to listen to God every day. There's all different ways to do that. Sometimes it's even as simple as listening to a podcast of some priest or some person who's just sharing with you their thoughts about uh, the readings for the day. It becomes a way of bringing Christ in and you just listen, you ponder, you meditate, sitting with Jesus. Reading the Bible is a great way to listen. All the other forms of prayer are awesome and great too but the ability to listen. Now, have you ever noticed that when you and I, when we have the ability to listen, it's actually very attractive. People are drawn to that, right? Um, if we speak too much, people keep looking at their watch. So don't look at your watch right now, please. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but to listen, people are drawn to that. Now, to be a good listener, though, means we actually are taking in what people are saying. Because when Christ shines his light, we then know where to shine the light because we've listened. We know what's in their heart, and now we know where to shine that light. So many times I've gone into a situation, I didn't listen, and I started shining the light, and I just blinded them. 
I didn't know where to shine the light because I didn't listen. So first, we listen to God and we listen to others. Listening, I think, is one of the best ways to, to gain wisdom, but not human wisdom. Just Jesus, Jesus' wisdom, so we can speak his language to others. Together we profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, God not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the Holy Spirit, was incarnate to the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son is the daughter glorified, as spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. God is light, from him comes all light, visible and invisible. We turn to him in prayer, asking for the graces he wishes to give us. That the church may show the power and radiance of the spirit to all seeking for truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the brilliance of the gospel may enlighten men and women entrusted with decisions for the good of all people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the bread which comes from God's creation and human work may be shared fairly. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That we may be the salt of the earth in our local community. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That eternal light may shine upon the departed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of our schools, that they may be places of safety and protection and protect our kids from error. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all helping young married uh, moms and dads to be good parents and spouses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, as we pray for others, we ask you to help us to share your light with them so that they may praise your goodness through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our offertory hymn is number 675. <laughs>
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O Lord, our God, who once established these created things to sustain us in our frailty, grant, we pray, that they may become for us now the sacrament of eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth he brought renewal to our fallen state. By his suffering, he canceled out our sins. By his rising from the dead, he has opened the way to eternal life. And by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. Indeed, holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness, make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfalls, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, <coughs> Take it. <clears throat> Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith.
Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Paul, our Archbishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, that we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Together we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace, <clears throat> peace, I leave you. <clears throat> peace, I leave <clears throat> We'll get there. <clears throat> peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of our Lord's peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
For those of you who are unable to receive the Eucharist at this time, the body of Christ we offer this spiritual communion prayer. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Our communion hymn is number 506.
Let us pray. O God, who have willed that we be partakers in the one bread and one chalice, grant us, we pray, so to live, that made one in Christ, we may joyfully bear fruit for the salvation of the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. The Knights of Columbus are continuing to sell tickets for their awards dinner that's coming up for, on February 15th. If anybody, any couples would like to be part of that, um, tickets are $12 per person. Uh, the Knights of Columbus are doing their breakfast today, and all of your donations go to, to help Two Hearts Pregnancy Aid. And so there, again, if you're kind of new to the area, Two Hearts uh, helps young moms, especially if they're in really dire circumstances, maybe even considering having an abortion, just to give them some love and support and, and help them also with some material needs if that is needed so that they can be able to just be good moms and, and love their, their children. Uh, they're also, Two Hearts is actually here doing a bake sale and doing a baby shower in the hall. And so if you like to, to help uh, with them, they are in the hall. Uh, a little reminder, so we had a car broken into last Sunday during the Spanish Mass. We're installing cameras, we're in process. We've, we've done all the cameras inside, now we're gonna start doing them outside. Um, we have the security teams, we're forming them, and that's all great, but it's not perfect. And so one of the things that they always seem to target is purses. So if, if your purse is in your car, please keep it out of sight because it's just a magnet for people who are, well, they should have heard my homily today about stealing. Anyways. <laughs> okay. Um, the office is open today. And you might notice we, we have installed uh, the, a structure here for a shrine. This is going to be for the Divine Mercy image. Uh, the image is not ready. It's, I think, another uh, month or two before it's ready. But just, uh, just so you can kind of see what's happening. Now we have shrines on both sides, so... The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Mass is ended. Let us go in peace. Thanks. Number four, five, three.